colorful glass and eye-catching plants, we're taking a look at colors in the garden in new and interesting ways right after this. Smith, welcome to the show. I know that we're right on the cusp of spring and many of you, well, are still feeling like you're in the midst of winter, digging out of the snow and ice. So why don't we focus on some really bright colors that'll get you revved up for the season ahead. We'll take a look at a favorite color combination of mine in the garden. That's chartreuse and blue. We'll figure out how to get those gorgeous colors closer to your home with just the right windows. And a chef at an internationally recognized cooking school dazzles us in the kitchen with this tasty dish. But first, putting glass to work in the garden. The colorful story behind bottle trees after this short break. Okay, what we have here is a bucket of bottles. Now, I could take them to the recycling center, but why not have a little fun with them? You see, in certain parts of the South, the tradition of creating bottle trees is alive and well. Felder Rushing from Jackson, Mississippi tells us a little more about this fascinating art form. People have always accessorized, painting things on the walls of their caves, hanging stuff out of holes in their ears, so it's a real natural to want to put things in your windows. And a lot of people have always put glass bottles in their windows because it's pretty. Uh, and a lot of people just take that out into the landscape. People have bottle trees, look for bottles anywhere we can get them. And the hardest to find are blue. I mean, really hard to find is a real red bottle, but blue bottles are the, they're the most popular for bottle trees. And there's real fancy wines. There's, there's a bottle of water that you'll pay like $8 a bottle for. There's a, a lot of people will buy a certain beverage just because it's in a blue bottle. Whether they use the beverage or not, who cares? Uh, but blue is hard to come by, and usually people get one at a time, and, and I can look at all the ones in my yard and tell you pretty much where they all came from. Well, I've, I've got the kind of peripheral vision that, that trashy people have. You know, gardeners are always looking for bowling balls and accessories, so anything that's colorful, that catches a little sunshine and reflects it, whether it's a gazing ball or a bottle tree or a mirror or anything like that, catches my eye. To me, a bottle tree that's really good is one that's homemade. I got an old Christmas tree with the limbs bobbed back and bottles stuck on it, or maybe some crepe myrtle branches or a dead cedar tree. Uh, instead of cutting it down, they just hang bottles or stick bottles over the branches. And I've seen them done both ways, either bottles full of colored water hanging in the trees, or else uh, most commonly just the branches cut back to about finger size and different color bottles uh, set on them. Most people like really, really colorful kinds with all different kind of bottles. Sort of like a kaleidoscope having a stroke, okay? But I like solid, like solid blue. One of my favorite bottle trees has got just green and clear bottles. It's not very showy, but it sparkles and it uh, brings a little color to the garden and it captures my imagination. And once you see a bottle tree, then all of a sudden you start seeing them pop up everywhere. And it's like it brings in a new element to, to, to your eye, to your appreciation of other people's gardens. Now, I always heard that the tradition of bottle trees came from the idea of placing bottles on a tree so at night the bottles would capture evil spirits. When the sun would come up, the sun would shine into the bottle and destroy the evil spirits. So they've gone from a way to getting rid of negative vibes in your yard and garden to garden art. At the Nashville Antiques and Garden Show, Hardy Todd showed us a bottle tree in his shop. This is my 13th year to do the Nashville Antique and Garden Show. And in my opinion, it's one of the premier shows in the South. Tremendous variety at this show. You'll see everything from $15 items to $20,000 items. There's basically something for everybody's taste, for everybody's budget. I myself carry items that range from $15 to about $5,000. I have certain items that I'm particularly interested in, this bottle tree for one. It goes back to voodoo origins in the South, Mississippi, Louisiana. It was uh, a form of art to ward off evil spirits. I like them 
in formal settings as well as informal settings, inside as well as outside. It's the sort of thing that'll work into any kind of decor. If you find the vivid colors of bottle trees inspiring, then you're going to love what's coming up next. I'll share with you some plants that will help you get this striking color combination, plus picking paints for your home once you've been inspired by nature. Hi, welcome back. In today's Color Corner, I wanted to showcase a couple of plants that really set off a color combination that I'm wild about. That is chartreuse and blue or purple, as you can see behind me. Now this little plant is called Bluebeard or Caryopteris. Now this variety is called Sunshine Blue, and it makes sense, the name, when you look at the leaf, there's the sunshine, and then just a little later, in late summer, you'll begin to see these buds form, and eventually they'll flower into gorgeous blue flowers. So there you get the blue. Now those flowers won't start appearing for another few weeks, but just look at the juxtaposition of this gorgeous golden mound against the backdrop of blue. Now the blue behind me is Scavola, or Fanflower, and this variety is called New Wonder. It's a great performer that flowers throughout the entire growing season. Now let's take a look at a few other plants that can give us this same color combination. Let's start with chartreuse. For a bit of wow, I grow zinnias in a lime green color, like these called Bonari's Giant Lime. And for fun and a bold plant, try growing golden delicious pineapple sage. The aroma is heavenly. Now you'll find Artemisia Oriental Limelight a beautiful plant, but I have to tell you, it can be invasive, it can get out of hand. So plant it in the garden where it's contained. It can be a real showstopper. And how about this favorite of mine? It's called Dolce Key Lime Pie Heuchera. Now some others to think about include Golden Cuban Oregano, Chartreuse Creeping Jenny, and even Coleus like Dappled Apple can bring a splash of Chartreuse into your garden. Moving on to purple and blue, you don't have to look far in my garden for examples of plants in this cool color palette. Supertunia Royal Velvet is a showstopper. Talk about a plant that just keeps on giving. Salvias perform beautifully in my garden, especially in the heat of summer. Some of the varieties I enjoy are Blue Victoria and Indigo Spires. And don't overlook Old Fashioned Purple Iris, Budlia or Butterfly Bush, or even Terenia, which always performs with fantastic blooms, even in drought-like conditions. Now, I know this will be a surprise to you, but I'm inspired by the colors of nature. They actually affect the way I choose colors inside the home. Just take a look at these two. This beautiful sort of creamy green is one called Bonsai Tint, and this one's called Bobble Blue, and I think they look great together. Recently, I had an opportunity to visit with a color expert who talked about the process of choosing paints. So Sherry, what do you think is the biggest challenge for someone in choosing a color? Really finding a starting point, and that can be from something that's familiar yeah. from their childhood. It yeah, could be something literal, fun. like a piece of fabric. It could be, a, you know, a, an heirloom rug, a significant piece of artwork. A chair. It could be. It could be any. It could be some inspiration from their garden if they right. want to bring that theme yeah, back into their home. looking out through the window, seeing Absolutely. something out there you want to bring back in. Absolutely. Sherry, do you think people are frightened by color? You know, color can be scary. It is. A, it is a scary decision to make to bring new color into your home, but there is certainly an awareness and more color confidence in the consumer today. People are exposed to more color. They want to bring more color into their home. And people are getting more confident in wanting to let color reflect their personality in their home as well. You know, I often ask people, what's your favorite color? And some will say, I, I don't know, I don't really have one. But you can go to their closet and look at their clothes and you can pick out a pattern of color, which means they gravitate towards certain colors. We all do. Absolutely. It's, it, again, it goes back to what we're comfortable with and what we're familiar with. And if you are comfortable wearing it every day, you'd obviously be comfortable with living with it in your in your surroundings. I'm often asked, what's your favorite flower, Alan? You know, and yeah. I go, well, you know, it depends on what's blooming in the garden. That's right. I tend to like what's there in flower, but uh, it is difficult to choose. I, I tend to like all colors, but I gravitate more toward blues and greens. I like those yeah. really, the real cool color palette. Sure. 
they're, they are, and they're, again, they're very versatile colors. They're very cool, they're calming. Um, you can use them with the darker colors. So if you have a dark color grounding a room, like on your floor, for instance, or if you have heavy furnishings that are in dark, exotic woods, the cool blues and cool greens are a great way to balance the darkness of those wood finishes. Now, Cher, you work with color every day. If someone is looking at maybe redecorating a room, are there any guidelines to follow? Should you choose fabrics first or pick your paint first? Or which should lead? That's a great question. Paint should really be the last component pulled together on, on any, any project because it's the most versatile. Start with your fabrics, work around your furnishings, again, your hard surface flooring and countertops. Um, if you have significant pieces of artwork or any large floral arrangements that are going in the room, work around those knowing that paint is the least expensive and most flexible component on the job. So paint should really be the last component chosen on the project. Well, that's great advice. Thanks a lot, Cherry. Thank you. From colorful paint to good picture making, we'll frame the views out in this garden with gorgeous windows. And then a little later in the show, we'll take a look at a recipe from an internationally recognized cooking school. It's all coming up after this. Now before we leave this color corner segment, here's a plant I just have to share. Large lemon yellow flowers are unique for a Shasta daisy. This quality makes Broadway lights a sunny face in the garden. But that's just the beginning of the show. The flowers transform to a buttery yellow cream color and finally turn pure white. Flowering begins early in summer and continues deep into the fall. Broadway Lights is a full sun perennial and it's ideal for zones 5 through 11. It's all about good picture making. Just like the artist sizes up his canvas, looks through the viewfinder and captures the perfect composition, we as gardeners are also looking for opportunities to create little vistas and vignettes in our gardens, but we're painting with plants. Now sometimes those views are rather grand, like this scenic vista beyond. Now, who wouldn't want to take advantage of that? Now, the architect that designed this home used that wonderful technique of framing the view by using windows. In other parts of the garden, he used plants to frame views, or in some cases, screen views. Throughout this house, the windows and doors transition the space between inside and out. Now, when I was thinking about creating my garden home, I began to realize the importance that these devices play in helping us bring the garden inside. A couple who lives along a river bank their entire living room with large windows that truly embrace the water and outdoor living spaces beyond. In a French-style country house, the windows create pictures out into the garden. Every window frames a different experience. And I really liked how a house in Germany had large sliding doors that opened completely up to allow the inside to spill outdoors. In a garden designer's studio that I once visited, her workspace was separated from the colorful garden beyond by only a pane of glass. I have to say that these images and many more beautiful landscapes kept swirling around in my head as I walked around the International Builder Show. There I saw a myriad of styles and designs for doors and windows, something to fit every architectural style. In one display, I caught up with Rob Hardy of Marvin Windows and Doors who gave me some pointers on items to consider. Talk about being able to just knock the wall down and step out into the garden. Well, you know, today's homeowners want to bring the outside in and the inside out, so just open up the entire wall and really live indoors and outdoors. For homeowners who are into restoration, it's difficult, I think, sometimes to, to find windows that work. And, you know, I've known people who have fell in love with a house and everything was great except the windows were really in poor shape. Do you reproduce Yeah, we're, I mean, we can match the existing window but yet give you the energy efficiency that you want with the low E glass and the better weather stripping that they have in today's energy efficient windows. You can still have that modern window technology, but with that old world charm. So Rob, what are some of the trends you're seeing in the industry? People, again, want to bring the outdoors in. They want to bring in natural light. So we're seeing uh, larger windows being used, much more windows in design, historical products that want to match that old existing. A product that they had in their home, trends in hardware. Really, people want their own signature on their windows. So they don't want their windows to look like their neighbors. So they want something a little bit different that's unique to their home. And I think that's one of the really growing trends that we're seeing in the industry today. After the break, a visit to a cooking school for a recipe that got an A plus in my book. Details after this.
Located in Greenwood, Mississippi, on the banks of the Yazoo River is the headquarters of Viking Range. Now this is an international kitchen appliance and accessory company. Here Viking trains retailers and the general public on the techniques for using their ranges and grills. Let's stop in the kitchen and see what executive chef Martha Foos has cooking. Our chipotle chili cornbread gets a little spike of heat from smoked jalapenos. We're just going to toast them briefly in a pan, then hydrate them in a little bit of simmering water till they become nice and pliable. Dice them up small. You can use a little pair of kitchen shears to help with that. We're going to start by combining our dry ingredients. We have a cup of golden cornmeal, a cup of all-purpose flour. We're going to add two teaspoons of granulated sugar, two teaspoons of salt, and two teaspoons of double-acting baking powder and use a whisk to combine and get out any lumps. Moving on to our wet ingredients, we're gonna combine one cup of whole buttermilk, one cup of regular milk, whole milk, a third of a cup of melted butter, our diced chipotle chilies, and one egg beaten. And add it right to our liquid ingredients. I'm going to use a little small whisk to combine these, make sure they're well mixed, and pour them right into the center of our dry ingredients. That's going to give our double acting baking powder a chance to act once. And we're going to stir it just till there are no lumps. You want to be careful not to over stir, your cornbread will get a little bit tough. So just until all the ingredients are moistened. We're going to coat our hot pan with just a touch of nonstick cooking spray. This classic southern technique of pouring our batter right in a hot skillet creates a nice crisp crust. We'll bake this in our 425 degree oven for 25 minutes or until it's a deep golden brown. This delicious cornbread is wonderful served with butter and a drizzle of honey. It's a time-tested favorite from the Viking Cooking School and we know you'll enjoy it. Well, this has certainly been a colorful show and just in time to inspire us for spring. If you'd like some of those color combinations we talked about, or even that recipe, just check out my website. That's pallensmith.com. Until next time, from the garden, I'm Alan Smith.